Good morning. My name is Andrea Benjamin. I'm an associate professor in the Clara Luger Department of African and African American Studies, and I'm really excited to be here today. Let's see, let me share my screen and get started. Today, I wanna to talk to you about voting and why I think your vote still matters. And so what I hope to do today is give a, just a brief history of voting rights, talk to you a little bit about voter suppression, some of the things that are going on currently. I definitely wanna to talk to you a little bit about gerrymandering. And then I wanna talk about local politics. That's my area of study. And what I hope you leave with today is an understanding of why I think local politics is so important and how I think each of the first three bullets really matter in the local context, but how that you know, bubbles up to what it means at the state and national levels. So first I just wanna go over a quick timeline of what has taken place. We know that when our country was founded, voting really meant voting white male property holders. That's who voters were at that time. We know that through a lot of efforts of a lot of people, uh, grassroots efforts, that after the end of slavery, we can think about re reconstruction as a time where barriers receded and we did see the election of African-Americans for the first time. However, that was sort of short-lived and rules were put back into place to restrict the African-American vote and people couldn't access the ballot. In the 1920s, we know that women worked really hard to gain the access, gain access to the ballot, but we also should note that even though we celebrated the centennial of women gaining the right to vote, here we really mean white women. And so even as we celebrated that last year, there was sort of an asterisk there because we know that native women, Asian American women, Latinx women, black women, they were not included in this expansion of the vote. As we move forward, we see in the 1960s that the South has increased restrictions, particularly towards black voters. And so that really culminates in the civil rights movement, the protests, um, and the legislation that emerges from that is the 1965 Voting Rights Act, which is supposed to reduce some of those restrictions that were in place, removing the grandfather clause, for instance, which is where you can only vote if your grandfather can vote. Given this timeline, what we know is most African-Americans wouldn't have been able to vote under that removing the, the tests, the literacy tests. As a professor, um, when I teach intro to American government, I'll give my students the tests and many of them can't pass. And so again, we know that those tests were there to restrict black voting. We also know that things like the poll tax, right? So that you had to have a certain amount of money to be able to vote. So the Voting Rights Act reduces or removes those barriers. In 1971, we see an expansion of vote through age. So moving the, vote, the voting age from 21 to 18, right? The rationale there is if, if these young people can go fight in a war, they should be able to vote. Um, in 1975, we see a, another expansion where we allow ballots to be produced in other languages, right? And so again, we think about the ballots of today. Sometimes they're very complicated. I can't imagine what it would be like to have English as a second language and try to make sense of some of the state ballot questions or ballot initiatives that are popping up everywhere. In 1982, we have an expansion to include uh, protections for people with disabilities. Uh, think about access to the ballot for, for that group. And then we also see at this time motor voter rules where making it easy for you to register that as you get your driver's license, you can also register at the same time. And again, we're just expanding the electorate at this point. In 2013, though, we know that the Supreme Court does strike a blow to the Voting Rights Act, right, and removes the preclearance requirement, which is where states, particularly those uh, that had had problems in the past, they would have to present a plan if they wanted to change their state voting rules. So we're gonna do this, is that okay? Someone would sort of come in and say, yes, you can make that change or no, you can't. So we remove that. And what do we see after that? A lot of states passing legislation that makes it harder for people to vote, even though we had spent so much time since the 1960s to really expand access to the ballot. What we've seen in the last eight years is reducing access to the ballot legislation that makes it harder for people to vote. Right now, HR1 just passed, and that is intended to roll back some of these state voting restrictions. Now, some people have been critical of the legislation because there's so far no money attached to it. And so even though it does create uniformity around registration and early voting, it makes it similar in all 50 states, 
it, there are questions about how it will be implemented if there's no money. And so let me just think about that for a second. Let's just think about that for a second, which is right now, if you live in a state like Washington or California, your ballot is mailed to you. You don't really have to do anything else. It just shows up. If you live in a state like Oklahoma, you have to request your ballot. Then to return it, I have to get a notary to sign it and get it notarized so that I, I know my ballot is going to count. And so again, this, this legislation is intended to make it equitable across all 50 states. We know that S1, the, the Senate version of this bill is currently being debated in the Senate. And so it's, it's to be determined what will happen with it. But again, the goal is to make voting easier and sort of level the playing field so that no matter what state you live in, your access to the ballot and access to voting is similar. At the same time, there are current states, right? States currently moving legislation through their house legislatures to reduce access to the ballot. Again, we know this week, Georgia did that, removes things like souls to the polls, reduces early voting, those types of things. And again, you know, that's just going to make it harder for people to vote. In the case of Iowa, they have reduced the number of hours at the polling places are open on election day. I'm not sure what happens between 7 and 8 p.m. Central Time that makes voter fraud more likely, but that's what they've decided to do. And I think of this as an access issue, not just based on race, but also on class. Not everyone works eight to five. Not everyone has the luxury of a job where they can just say, hey, I'm going to be late today. I got to go vote. And their boss is like, that's fine. And so I think when we think about election day, that, that Tuesday or, or whenever it is, not only in November, I'll get to that, but that we are sort of privileged if we have a type of job that we can just take the day off and it doesn't matter how long the lines are, it doesn't matter, we're still going to get our paycheck. And so I think even a 7 to 8 p.m. might be a time where someone who works a different schedule might be accessing the ballot and now we've taken that, that opportunity away from them. Uh, there are also efforts in many states to make sure that voter rolls are current. And so in some ways that they might be cleaning up the list and making sure that I am not registered at two different locations, that, that, that makes sense. But there are also places where they're actually purging voter rolls and where I am registered correctly and somehow you've decided to take my name off. And so there are these things going on that are concerning to some people. Now, we just finished the census last year, and we are still awaiting the census data, but across the country, state legislatures are meeting to decide how are we going to draw our districts. And when we talk about redistricting, um, which is a mandate, it, we do it every 10 years after we receive the census data to account for population change, there are questions about what, what's being done. And often in that conversation is this idea of gerrymandering. And this is where you've drawn districts that don't have any uniformity of shape, and they come from a, a district that looked like a salamander, right? And so if you look on the left picture, what you'll see is what we call packing in the gerrymandering world. And this is where we put people who vote for the pink party, we put them all together, basically ensuring that only one member of the pink party will be elected in this area. If we think about the blue party, uh, it looks like there might be one, two, three districts there. And we would expect because more, you know, there's three districts where a lot of people who vote for the blue party live that we would expect them to elect a blue party member. On the right, what we have is cracking. And this is where it's the same image, but the black lines are drawn differently. And so here we have three districts, but what you'll see is that the way it's the, red, the pink party has been cracked, it's unlikely that they will elect anyone really, because there are more blue party squares in that new district. And so that essentially assures that only the blue party will be electing anyone to represent them. Now, 2018 ended up being a strange natural experiment that we can look at between what happened in Pennsylvania and what happened in North Carolina. Now in Pennsylvania, um, they made some changes, but in North Carolina, there was no change. So in 2018, during that congressional election, what you can see here is that 40, 48% of the residents of North Carolina across these various districts, you know, Democrats, you know, 48% of the votes were Democrats. But when you look at how it translated into seats, 
it ended up being that there were nine seats where Republicans won and only three seats where Democrats won. You might also recall that one district is not included here because there were some, some serious accusations of voter fraud there that, that so this is not, does not include that, right? But what you can see is that basically in North Carolina, what they've done is packing, right? That so there are essentially three extremely democratic districts and that is the only place that Democrats win, even though the number of voters almost 50% of the vote was Democratic. And so you could see even if maybe it wasn't nine to three, maybe it was like, I don't know, seven to six, right? That might seem more reasonable to you, but that's not what happened. And as I mentioned in Pennsylvania, they actually made some changes to the districts. And so you can see in the 2016 election results in Pennsylvania, again, Republicans won 54% of the vote compared to Democratic again, just across all the aggregation of, of voters, compared to 46% of Democratic voters. And in 2016, that meant 13 seats were Republican and five seats were Democratic. When the, the Supreme Court got involved, uh, the Pennsylvania Supreme Court, I believe, got involved, then it was 55% Democratic votes, again, total in the whole state, and 45% Republican, but it ended up being nine Democratic seats and nine Republican seats because of the new districts that were drawn. And so again, this is why it matters. Because, you know, sure, it does appear that the Democrats overall in those two years did gain more votes overall among their, their you know, residents. But still, that's a little bit of a better turnout, right? In that you shouldn't look at a state and see that it, you know, one party has received almost 50% of the vote, and they get only a third of the seats, right? And so these are questions that are really important. So one thing I would say to you is if you're interested in this, your state is having conversations trying to get their districts drawn, th this might be a place for you to plug in. And so again, just thinking historically, there have been a lot of challenges around who is able to vote. It took federal legislation to allow women to vote, uh, to open the access, to access the ballot for people of color to make sure that we had ballots that were in proper languages, to make sure that those differently able could access the ballots, to make sure that young people could access the ballots. It is something that's really important. And I, I say that only because if it didn't matter, people wouldn't be spending so much time trying to refine who can and cannot vote. And so I think that's just really something to really think about. But I think I mentioned to you that my area of research is actually local politics. I study cities and think about the way that various groups can get their, their positions represented. Um, but it is true that all politics is local. And that is sort of the classic line when it comes to local politics. And so one of the paradoxes is that you might even be thinking, oh, Andrea, if local politics is so important, how come we don't hear about it very much? And I think that's a really fair point, right? Is that the importance of, of what goes on in local politics is certainly not reflected in the amount of money we spend on it or the amount of interest and time that we spend on it. But it is true that your local government, your city, your municipality, your town, they control a lot of things that affect your day-to-day -day life, whether that's your municipal waste, the cost of public utilities, zoning, that is what you can and cannot do with your property depending on the way it's been zoned, all of that is handled locally. And I would argue that those things affect your day-to-day -day life so much more than even things at the state and national level. And you know, I'm, I'm, I know this is what I study, so I'm gonna stick to that, but I, I really want us to think about what, what really happens in our day-to-day -day lives. If you don't have a safe sidewalk, then it might be hard for you to access the local bus transit, right? That these things really matter. And it is the city that will decide where new sidewalks go, where sidewalks are uh, fixed and, and things like that. But it is also true that during the reform era, Local politics, local cities made cities made a lot of choices that sort of feed into why we don't hear so much about local elections. One is that most local elections are nonpartisan. And so as a practice, sometimes if you haven't done all your voting homework, if you show up and you see, oh, they're a member of my party. I'm a registered Republican. I see the R next to their name. I know who to vote for. Or I'm a registered Democrat. I see the D next to their name. I know who to vote for. Local politics, for the most part, two thirds of cities don't provide you that little piece of information. So that's one thing. It is also true that many of these elections take place in off year. So we're in 2021. 
many of the major cities in the United States are going to have elections for their mayor and council today. And it's not everybody, right? There's ways that um, the council might have, half of them are elected in one odd year and then four years later, um, more, you know, the other half are reelected, things like that. Um, but what it means is that, again, we're just sort of not paying attention. So it's a random Tuesday in May and you're supposed to be voting. And we typically think of voting and elections as November, right? So these are choices that were made. None of them make it easier or sort of have made it more popular or fun for people to vote in local elections. But the other thing that's really interesting about cities and local governments is that they are granted permission to govern by the state government. And so whereas the states are in the constitution and they have powers, cities get their powers from the state. What does that mean? Again, you might be in a municipality, a charter, but this is where the rules come in. And so your city might do something called a charter review where they revise something. They usually put it to you, the voter, and you determine, yes, we wanna move forward with that or no, we don't. Um, but the charter is the rules that govern your city. Um, and so that's just something that, that people might not know. And again, there are lots of different ways that these local governments are uh, formatted and, and that's another place that makes it confusing because if you move, you might have been used to one system and then you move to a new city and it's completely different. And so again, it's not uniform. Um, many of them have a ma manager, a mayor council system, right? And uh, that means the mayor's elected, they're the head, they, are, they serve with the council, they might be in charge of some things. But many cities have a council manager system where the mayor and the council do pass ordinances, but they're mainly the face of the city. And on the back end, they hire someone called a city manager that essentially runs the day-to-day -day of the city. And so you might be calling your mayor about something and he or she might say, that's not my job. And they're not lying to you. It's not their job. It's the city manager's job. Um, but again, in both cases, we the voters are electing people that deliberate and make choices about what we're doing. Um, and then there's also county governments, which I won't spend too much time in today, but they, they are also another level of local government, and they sort of have purview over different things, like your local health department is a county level um, office, and so you might elect a county commissioner and they oversee those things. So here I'm just going to show some you know, so the strong mayor council is here. So the people were there. We vote for the mayor and the council. Um, but here you see the mayor is strong because the mayor is the one that proposes the budget. They appoint the key city officials. They also propose policy that's then, you know, voted on, but they might have veto power. And so in that sense, it looks how you think it is. It's in this situation, the mayor is strong and the mayor can actually do things. They are the executive of their city. A city like New York, Los Angeles, Chicago, some of our major cities have strong mayor systems. Here with the weak mayor, um, you know, the, the mayor is only a figurehead and they might be appointed by the council, right? So maybe you vote for a whole mayor, you, hope you vote for a whole council and from within the council, they elevate a mayor to be the figurehead. Here, the council is kind of strong, right? Because they're making policy, they pass the budget, uh, they have veto power. And so that's just another style of system. The system where probably most of us live, uh, if we live in sort of anywhere where, that's not true, some small cities have strong mayors, but most many of us live in cities where we have a mayor, um, a council manager system. And here again, we the citizens, sorry, I stole this. There's not a neutral chart. I guess I could have made one, but this is from Champaign. And so the citizens of Champaign elect their city council. That includes the mayor. The city council appoints boards and commissions. I want to point that out because we're going to come back to it, but they hire and fire the city manager. And as you can see here, that city manager is the one, they're in charge of everything. They set the first budget usually, they handle all the departments, um, right? And so that's really what we mean by your city manager is actually doing a lot of work and you think, oh, that's what the mayor does, but it's actually what the city manager does. And, and we can come back to this. Again, there's a, a system called the city commission system where you just vote commissioners, the mayor, it's an equal system. And then those, those commissioners and mayor manage things. That's a very rare system, but I did wanna show you that. Um, again, sometimes the, the people just elect the actual heads of departments or commissioners. And so they, they run those things. Again, these are just different systems. Hopefully you can go to your own city and find the organizational chart and it will, let, it will be very clear who's in charge of what. But the one thing I love about local government is the access that we have to them. 
you can attend your city council meeting, even in a pandemic, you can log into Zoom and attend the meeting. Never in our life are we just gonna be able to attend um, you know, the, the hearings that go on in Congress. We can watch them on TV for sure, so maybe the Zoom corollary, but even in Zoom, you can sign up for public comment. The same thing with city county commissioner meetings, you can attend those uh, during normal times. They are also available on Zoom. There's always a public comment and also school board meetings, which I didn't really talk about because it's sort of its own thing. But again, these are things that you can just go to and attend. And I think that is truly the beauty of local politics. But I want to take a step back because as I started, you know, all politics is local, but the sort of paradox of it is that we don't spend that much time on it and we don't put that, we don't see as much spending on it people don't turn out at the same levels. And so even though in 2020, in the last presidential election, unprecedented voter turnout, 66.3% of people voted. Local elections are just not that popular. So I'm gonna share a figure where this data is not super recent, but it is some of the, it's a, it's a great infographic where we can look. And so a city like Portland, Oregon, almost 60% of their local residents are voting in their mayoral election. That's what this data is. But then it's just kind of downhill from there, right, to where we get to Dallas, which is a major city, right? It's a large city, and only 6% of their eligible voters voted in that mayoral election there whenever this data was taken. And that's a big drop off, right? And so even though we might be so excited, oh my gosh, I voted in 2020, 66%, 6% of people are then turning around, not everywhere, obviously, Detroit, you know, there's variance in there, but it's just not as high, right? It would be great if we saw this chart and city after city was at 60, 60%, even 59%, the Portland uh, data. And so again, right, we saw that unprecedented turnout, but even in Georgia with the runoff, we saw new voters that didn't even vote in 2020. And so what we've, you know, across the country, states have been asking themselves, who's our Stacey Abrams? Um, and in many ways, I think that's a good question, but I think it's not the right question because I think there are many Stacey Abrams in any one state and they're doing the work on the ground. And I wanna talk about that a little bit. And I also wanna say that any coverage that you found of Stacey Abrams and Fair Fight, they've been very uh, sort of transparent that it wasn't just them. And I think that's sort of really the position that if you care about voting, you should be taking is it's not the work that I'm going to do. It's how do I support the work that's being done because we all have the same goal, which is you know, robust and engaged residents that care about politics. And so again, right, uh, turning Georgia blue is just sort of this, this thing that's on everyone's mind right now. And even as I mentioned to you earlier, just this week, Georgia passed legislation to restrict access to voting, right? And this, this could be why. Um, but again, she didn't start this overnight, right? It took her 10 years to do this. And so to those who are saying, who is our state, Stacey Abrams, again, that might not be the right question is, who's on the ground doing the work that we think we can bring this to fruition in 10 years? It's not going to be an overnight project. Finally, right, we know that the GOP has already proven to be really good at organizing, right? And so this democratic response is, is not the only response that's being taken, right? That the GOP has been doing state level organizing and it has paid off for them as most state legislatures are dominated by Republicans. And so again, right? Just this idea that Stacey Abrams has been really willing, even though that, that's the name that everyone is saying, she's always giving credit to the organizations that were already doing the work that she helped support, um, that, that, that she, through funding, I mean, um, right, that that's, that's just one model. And so I wanna talk about why I think grassroots organizations are so important. Number one is that they're already doing the work, y'all. Um, we don't have to reinvent the wheel. In each of our communities, there are people who have been doing the work. And I think they matter because the community trusts them. And I think that is one thing that, that, that is missing a lot of time is what's the role of trust and what's the role of accountability. If you show up, if you're gung-ho for a candidate and you canvass for two weeks, I'm sure that candidate appreciates you, but the community doesn't know you. And so, and you're gonna leave. And so I think if we can support those organizations that are already doing the work across, you know, across all political spectrums, there are people doing the work. So can we support them? 
they are going to be held accountable because they live there. And so in after the election, if something doesn't come to fruition, I and my community can go to my grassroots organization and say, hey, I thought we were doing this thing, what happened? And there's a conversation. So that trust is built, but I also have a mechanism to hold you accountable. If I just drop into a community and do some door knocking and I leave, no one can find me to say, hey, Andrea, you promised us this thing. We don't have it. They can't even find me. They don't even know me. Um, but I think the most important thing is that they have the ability to meet the community where they are. And I can't overstate that, right? And so what we saw in Georgia this summer was not separate voter registrations. These organizations showed up to register new voters where they were doing COVID testing. That was where the people already were. Or if there were food donation um, drives, that's where the community already was. So if they were, again, they're not reinventing the wheel even themselves, they're working in tandem. They're working together to bring those things to fruition. And again, they have the ability to mobilize voters. If I'm in my community and I'm a known entity and I say, hey, y'all, it's really important that we show out and support this candidate, I might be able to mobilize people. Again, just random door knocking. While it is effective and it is important, thinking again about what's the trust and accountability there. And so again, what we might ask ourselves is who are the organizations on the ground already doing the work and how can I partner and support with them? And I think that's just really important from a local politics standpoint. Again, if you wanna, for, for various reasons, and I'll, I'll get to that in a second, because you might be saying, how can I get involved? And I'm always, always gonna say, you should consider running for office, especially at the local level, whether it's school board, city council, maybe even county commission. Some of those are full-time jobs though. So I understand people have careers, but get involved. Think about running for office. The hurdle is the lowest at the local level. It doesn't require the same amount of fundraising, um, but we need people like you. And I always say that, but also just participate in local politics. Commit to being a local voter. Is your city having city council election this, elections this year or mayoral elections? Please commit to getting involved, being knowledgeable, attend a candidate forum and be a local voter. That's gonna put you into that world and you're gonna be paying attention because you're gonna say, oh, I voted for council member A. They said they were gonna work on the sidewalks in my neighborhood. In a couple of years, if it's not done, you can contact council member A and say, hey, you ran on the new sidewalk. I don't see one, right? That you have that access. If that's too much even, uh, but at least support a local candidate, whether that's door knocking for them, helping literature drop for them, obviously making donations to them, that's really important. Another way is to join a border commission. And I, I think I highlighted that on the Champagne organizational chart, but these are boards and commissions that require volunteers to serve on them. They do a variety of things. There's fun, cool boards like the art board. There's important boards like the library board or the parks board. The zoning board is really important. You might serve on a human rights commission, uh, but, but these are, they need volunteers. And right now those boards and commissions are not very diverse. And so if, again, if you care, it's a way for you to get involved. It's not running for local office, which might be a bigger commitment than you're willing to make, but it is something that you can do. At, again, attending your local city council meetings, let people know that you're engaged and that you're checking in, you care. Um, and if you need to contact your city council members, they're very accessible. They're great. Um, I have always found that no matter where I live, I've had a good relationship with my city council members. And I think that's just really wonderful. And it's a part of government that we often won't do. I can't just call my state representative. Well, that's not true. I do know my state representative too in the state house legislature, but um, I, you know, I don't, I don't know my congressional representative at all. I don't know my senators here. Those, that feels hard. Those are bigger hurdles. I'm sure I could reach out to them, but they're not gonna be the ones that personally write me back. It's gonna be a staffer. And so, again, you can also think about getting involved with your redistricting in your state. That's happening now. They are doing forms. They're doing candidate things. Um, um, they're doing um, information sessions to get people's feedback. And then again, participate in state politics, right? Support state level candidates, contact your state representatives and senators. They are also accessible, mostly. Um, and so I think that's just a way for you to get involved if you aren't already. So thank you so much for your time. I hope that you really came away with some ideas about ways to get involved. And I, I really hope that you came away knowing that their local politics really does matter and uh, it's underlooked and it's uh, undervalued sometimes, but, but it is really important. And I hope that that was clear today. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoy the rest of the conference.